In this example, we're going to look at using Dask together with Pandas for the Dask data frame library. This provides a Pandas-like interface, but at massive scale. So we'll be able to use Pandas-like API calls to process very large volumes of data. Uh, one Dask data frame here is many Pandas data frames, either in memory across a cluster or on a single machine or lazily streamed through memory. So I've asked for a cluster of 30 machines here. This data set is somewhat large. Those machines uh, you can see here. So we've got you know, a bunch of machines sitting on Amazon. Uh, total memory is about, about a half terabyte. Um, not too big, but sort of big, bigger than my laptop. So what we're going to do, we're going to use the DAS data frame read parquet function. If you're using pandas, this would be the pandas put read parquet function. DAS data frame and pandas follow the same API. They're built by the same people. And let's load in that data. So I'm accessing parquet data set living on Amazon S3. And we can see here just the first few rows. So you might be familiar with the New York City taxicab data set. It's been around for a decade. It's been used in every single example. This data set is a fun variation. Uh, rather than the, like, the iconic yellow ca cabs, it's every Uber ride and Lyft ride in New York City. Uh, and so if you ever used Uber, you know that the experience is a little bit different. For example, rather than being a pickup time when the cab got the, the, the rider, the passenger, there was a request time, the person entered into their phone, when the driver showed up on scene, and then when the when the pickup actually heard, when the pre -pre person got into the car, right? And so the, the Uber Lyft experience is like a little bit different from the sort of standard cab experience. We'll also look at things that like, you know, about you know, how much do drivers make versus passengers paying, that sort of thing, that's fun. So this object looks a lot like a pandas data frame, but it's not, it's a DAS data frame. DAS data frames are lazy structures that break up a large data set into many small pieces. Uh, to make that explicit, we're going to actually persist this data set in RAM. And what we'll see is that it is breaking up um, my large S3 Parquet data set into 720 different Pandas data frames. And those Pandas data frames are being loaded into RAM uh, across our cluster. So every line here corresponds to the one core of my cluster, about 100 cores in this cluster. And those machines are reading in one block of Parquet data into a Pandas data frame, another block of Parquet into a Pandas data frame, etc. We now have 720 Pandas data frames living in memory across 30 machines that we're renting on Amazon. Uh, and that's great. We can go and we can query those 720 Pandas data frames. So a very simple query, for example. Uh, there's a bunch of columns with interesting data here. It's a fun data set. I recommend taking a look at it. Uh, let's look at the base passenger fare. How much did passengers pay in the city of New York? Actually, first, like how large is this data set? Right, so let's request date time. Min, we'll call compute. So this data set goes from beginning of 2019, looks like end of January, to the sort of middle of 2023, when I sort of first started processing this data set. Just a few years of data. How much did New Yorkers pay on ride shares in that sort of three or four year span? Let's go and find out, right? Is it $10 million? Is it $100 million? Is it a trillion dollars? Uh, so it's a very simple computation. Oops. Right. Oh, that's a big number. Let's divide that by a million, just so it's a little bit easier to read. Great. About 15 or $16 billion. That's about how much New Yorkers, people visiting New York, spent. As another example, how much did drivers make relative to passengers paying? If we're paying $15 billion, how much are drivers making at the same time? Uh, I asked people this at conferences. I got lots of different results. Some people say like, oof, 1% or 10%. Um, and the answer is, it's interesting. Um, it is. So in your mind, have a guess. Is it half? Is it you know, greater than 100%? Are drivers making more? Um, it's about $12 billion. I was surprised. Like Drivers actually make a decent, a decent fraction of what passengers pay. It's worth remembering that Uber and Lyft are highly unprofitable. They are burning billions of dollars every year. Um, but so let's take a look at what's actually happening here. I am uh, interactively typing in Pandas-like operations. The only difference here between the Pandas API and the Dask data frame API is this compute call. Right? Other than that, they're exactly the same. When I run a function like that, Dask takes my requests and it breaks it up into lots of little Python functions that run on all those little 720 Pandas data frames spread across memory. Those functions take you know, three milliseconds each. This one up here took 3.6 milliseconds. It finishes all of those, it transfers those to one machine, well, transfers took about 20 to 30 milliseconds. Then there's some final aggregation. 
This is a very simple sort of MapReduce style algorithm. It's a very simple computation. It's something slightly more complicated, right? So let's look at, well, first let's look at tips. So let's look at df.tips of non-zero. So how often do people tip in an Uber ride? In New York City, if you're in a cab, like 90% of people tip in a cab. It's just very normal practice. But the experience in Uber and Lyft is different. You don't really, uh, you don't give a tip to the direct person. You do it afterwards, you're on your phone, you're walking around. Uh, do people tip differently? The answer is yes, people tip very differently. People tip only about 15% of the time. Um, and again, you see like a slightly more complicated computation here. There's some sum computations, there's some count computations. It's, uh, it's a, little more, a little more varied. Um, Let's keep going. So there is another column in here, the license number. Uh, let's go see what the sort of frequencies are of that. There we go. So more complicated computations, more work that's being done here, also more red, more transfers. And what we're doing here is we're looking at how many rides had which license number. This is telling us which company is uh, serving as sort of a market for the ride. Is it Uber? Is it Lyft? Lyft is a competitor to Uber in the States. It's about half as popular. And you can see here that, oh yeah, this, this number 003 is probably Uber. Uh, this one is Lyft. Uh, and these are, there's some other sort of alternatives. There's like Via or Re a van share service or some other ones. Um, so we can, I'm guessing this one's Uber because it's the most popular. Uber is still the most popular service. So let's do this more complicated computation still. And let's, let's compute this tip fraction uh, broken down by a carrier. Do Uber riders or Lyft riders tip differently, for example? So we'll make a new column, uh, tipped, as if we have a, a non-zero tips value. So there actually was a tip for the ride. And let's go ahead and group by DF, this uh, license number, grab the tipped column and compute the mean. Right, so a mildly more complicated pandas query. It'll take a little bit more time. So this you know, ran for, you know, two or three seconds rather than half a second. What we find is that you know, Uber riders tip a little bit less than 15%. Lyft riders tip a little bit more than 19%. There's some difference, like Lyft riders are, Lyft is known to be a bit more driver friendly, so this sort of tracks our intuitive understanding, but the difference is marginal. Um, anyway, this shows you again just how normal Python pandas code can be written, and then DAS can break that up into lots of small little functions that can be run. This is what DAS data frame does. It takes your pandas code, breaks it up, runs it on lots of different pandas data frames in parallel, and it gives you a result. These are very simple queries. Often I get two questions when I give this demo live. People ask like, well, what parts of pandas are implemented and not implemented? People also ask, how do I get 30 machines on the cloud? That sounds really hard. So if you go to the, let's go see up here. Go to the DAS documentation for data frames. So you go to docs.das.org, go to data frames. You want to look at the API. So the pandas developers work with the DAS data frame developers. They're often the same developers. And they've implemented mostly every bit of the pandas API. Almost every single function is implemented. Some examples that are hard or not implemented are things like median. Right? It's hard to do compute median in parallel. But there are good parallel alternatives, like approximate quantiles. Also, some behaviors you might do, like iterating through every row in your pandas data frame, you should probably not do on a billion row data frame. Uh, but in general, the DAS data frame API is pretty much exactly compliant with the pandas API. When pandas releases, DAS data frame releases. They're very much in sync. Also, when pandas improve, DAS data frame improves naturally, because DAS data frame is just a bunch of pandas data frames. We use the same memory system. Uh, the other thing people often ask is, that sounds great, how do I actually get a bunch of machines? First, you don't have to. DAS data frame can work on your own machine, just one machine, processing data that doesn't fit in RAM, but does fit on disk. If you want to do that, you type in from dask.distributed, import client, client equals client. This gives you just a simp single cl simple cluster on your laptop. It's very easy to get started. You just have to pip install dask or cond install dask. What I did at the very top here, though, I wanted a bunch of machines, and so I created a DAS cluster using Coiled. There are many ways to create DAS clusters. Again, if you go to the DAS documentation, look at deploy DAS clusters. There are many options here. People often choose things like Kubernetes or high-performance computers. Those are the two most common options. But Coiled is easier. Um, 
So I'm just gonna show you an example of how this works. I asked for 30 machines, but let's actually get a little bit more fun, right? Let's go for, you know, let's ask for machines with, you know, maybe eight cores each. Let's ask for 50 machines. Let's go for a different region. Maybe my data isn't in US East 2. Maybe it's in you know, EU Central 1. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm in Frankfurt. We also try out, you know, ARM infrastructure, right? ARM is a little bit cheaper these days. We can also try out things like, uh, like Spot or other options. But let's just leave that as for now. Oops, I missed a comma. There we go. So, Coil is going to give me that cluster in about two minutes. And what it does first is it, because I didn't provide a Docker image that I want to use, it's looking at my local machine and it's figuring out, you know, what Conda packages do I have? What PIP packages I have? It actually notices I've got a development version of a library of Tuna. And so it builds a wheel for that for me. And it shifts that specification up to the cloud in a way that can be reproduced on a Linux machine remotely. Then it goes and it provisions 50 machines uh, to my specifications uh, living on uh, EU Central, the region that I wanted. Um, and so we're finishing 50 machines. And in about a minute, I'm going to have that cluster ready to go, ready to do work. Right? So those machines are done provisioning. They're booting. They're turning on Ubuntu. They're turning on Linux. Uh, and then we start downloading that software environment. And again, about a, in about a minute, I'm going to have all those machines at my disposal. Uh, this is a great way to very rapidly experiment with parallel computing and very easily uh, access remote data. Cool to handle a lot of those things for me, a lot of the infrastructure costs that I would have to figure out or talk to uh, like a DevOps team for. Uh, I'm gonna let that run, but if you want to see some other examples, you might check out uh, the Dask Futures demo, which give you sort of more of a fundamental understanding of how Dask operates, and also some other things that Dask can do. You can also try out some of the machine learning applications uh, that Dask can provide. Dask has great integrations with libraries like XGBoost for gradient boosted trees or like GBM, or also libraries like Optuna for hyperparameter optimization used in conjunction with systems like PyTorch and GPUs. So that's it. Thanks for your time. Cheers.